everybody I said praise the Lord I welcome you to our Bible study tonight in Jesus name Amen. wonderful to be with you in Abakaliki here and I believe the Bible study of tonight will enrich your life in Jesus name we're going to rise up and pray to the Lord as we prepare for the Bible study Open your mouth and talk to the Lord That the Lord will enrich your life today And the Lord will bless you Through the Bible study I want to hear you pray I want to hear a bacalique voice A boy you stage Call upon the Lord and tell the Lord That the Lord will enrich your life the Lord will teach you his word by the Spirit. And your life will never be the same again. The Bible study gives you light, gives you understanding. Gives you strength. Gives you backbone as a Christian. To know how to live. How to stand Stand firm How to live by Christian conviction Pray that the Lord Will use the study of tonight To do something powerful Something mighty Something supernatural in your life. If you've been a Christian, that will be a stronger, firmer, holier, enriched, more enriched Christian. And if you're still finding your way how to be a real Christian, that the Lord will open your eyes tonight. Make you understand what Christ has for you. In Jesus' name we pray. A bon ye state, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless your name. We thank you because we know you are a mighty God. And your word is powerful. Your word is mighty. And through this word, supernatural power comes upon every life. And we're thanking you tonight because... You are going to touch and transform every life. Turn us around in Jesus' name. Send your spirit from above. And touch everyone. And do great things in every life. In Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to our study of the Bible. And tonight we continue 
for the study of the epistle general of Jude. Jude was one of the followers of Christ, one of the servants of Christ, one of the disciples of Christ, one of the people that believed in the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and through that came to salvation, the common salvation, the comprehensive salvation, and eventually came to the consummate salvation. And as we look at the epistle he has given to us, he goes to the Old Testament, and then he brings out the personalities in the Old Testament. He brings out all the great things that happened in the Old Testament, and he brings a lesson for you, and he brings a lesson for me. And today we're looking at verse 11. He's been talking about what happened to the church at that time. And then for the church of the end time, the pilgrims to heaven, the people that have in mind that were following Jesus and were following him to heaven, is talking to us who are heavenly minded and heavenward pilgrims of the end time. And it calls us to remembrance. It says, think about this. It says, read this one. It says, remember this one. That's what he's doing now in Jude chapter 1. Actually, it has only one chapter. And we're looking at verse 11. It says, Warn to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for the word and perished in the gainsaying of Corinth. He goes to the Old Testament and he brings out the story of three people. Number one, Cain. Number two, Balaam. Number three, Korah. Actually, in the Old Testament, that name, Korah, comes in the New Testament now because it's written in Greek. That's why it says Korah here. But actually, the name in the Old Testament was Korah. And as he talks about this, you are wondering, why should I read about Cain? Why should I read about Balaam? Why should I read about Korah? Let me show you something. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 15. And I'm reading here from verse 5. Romans chapter 15. And we're looking at verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. You'll see why New Testament believers read the Old Testament. Why we study the Old Testament. Why we believe the Old Testament. Why we apply the words of the Old Testament to our lives. It says in Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching for time. We're reaching for our learning that we through the comfort, the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It says, whatsoever things were reaching, reaching in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. It said, the reaching for our admonition was that for our learning, was that for our instruction, was that to show us the way that through that comfort of the scriptures and through that learning of the scriptures in the Old Testament, we'll have hope and we'll have comfort. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Now these things were for our examples to the intent, that means to the purpose, we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. He said, you're going to find some people in the Old Testament, they didn't live right. They didn't behave well. They didn't act according to their knowledge of the Lord Almighty. He said, that's a bad example. He says, they are reaching for us not to copy them but to avoid the lifestyle. Look at verse 11 there. 11. It says now. All these things happened unto them. For examples. And they are reaching for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's saying it happened at the beginning of the world. It happened to Cain. Beginning of the world. It happened to Balaam. The beginning of the children of Israel as a nation. 
It happened to Korah, the beginning of the history of the children of Israel. But now for those of us who are at the end of time, you are at the end of time. Christ is about to come. And because Christ is coming, he has given us the Bible. He has given us all these things that we are reading and studying today so that that will help you. And I pray that tonight you receive help in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen over there. Now we are called to remembrance. That is, we've heard about Cain. He says, talk about that again. We've heard about Balaam. He says, tell me that story again. And we've heard about Korah. And he says, I want to hear about that. What else can I learn from that? First of all, I want to tell you that God wants us to learn and to remember. And to remember and to act on what we remember. Let me show you some scriptures that tells you, that tells me, that tells us all together. Remember. Remember. Don't forget, it's the word of God. In Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. And I'm reading here from verse 40. In Numbers chapter 15 verse 40. It tells us here. It says that she may remember. That's the word. That's the word. That she may remember. And do all my commandments. And be holy unto your God. It says there's one thing. There's one reason why you remember. There's one reason why you read. And there's one reason why the preacher, the teacher of the word will come to remind you. Look at this man. Look at this other man. See this other man. You remember so that you will do the commandments of the Lord and be holy unto the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 17 and verse 32. We're looking at the word remember and see what Jesus Christ himself said about remember in Luke chapter 17 verse 32. Remember Lord's wife. Again, it's going back to Genesis. It's going back to the beginning you know, of the history of the world. And it says that happened at the beginning. And those of us who are living at the end of the age, at the end of the world, it says you must remember. Remember Lord's wife. What happened to her? Well, she came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we were told not to look back, not to turn back, not even to think about what's behind you. Burn those bridges behind you and forget about them. Don't look back. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Jesus Christ said, remember. He tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. I'm reading here from verse 31. Acts chapter 20 verse 31. It says, therefore watch and remember. You see that? From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's reminding us over and over again. It says, are you a believer? Are you a child of God? Do you read your Bible? Do you study the Bible? It says, don't forget what you read. Remember. And now Paul the Apostle says, watch and remember, that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day, with tears that must be very serious. He was so concerned about their lives, so concerned about their Christian profession, and so concerned about whether they made it to heaven or not. And because of that, he said, You must remember a forgetful Christian might some backslide. He hears the word of God, he never remembers. He hears the word of God, he never thinks it through. He hears the word of God. He never meditates on the word. He hears the word of God. He never plans his life on the word. But the Bible says, you hear, remember. You read, remember. You learn, remember. You are taught, remember. It is what you remember that will carry you through in your Christian life. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 5. Just to 
Remember, it says in verse 5, Remember ye not, don't you remember? Of course you must. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. He's telling us again. He said, I told you before. You remember? You learned this before. You remember? You've had this before. You remember? He said, you must remember. That's what gives us the victory. That's what makes us consistent in our Christian lives. I'm born again. I'm converted. I'm on my way to heaven. And then there are pitfalls in the way. And there are challenges in the way. And I always make sure I remember. Somebody there, you'll keep on remembering. Look at Jude. In Jude, I'm reading from verse 17. Jude. We're looking at verse 17. In verse 17, but beloved, remember ye the words. It must be very important, mightily important, that from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from all those writers, and from Jesus Christ himself, this word comes up often in their mouths. And it says, remember, verse 17, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be scoffers in the last time, in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. The word is, remember, Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 5, remember therefore, here is Jesus Christ now, remember therefore, telling his church, telling his people, Telling those who are following him, it says, Remember therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first words, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. It says, It's not just to recall, it's not just to remember. You must do something about it when you remember. You remember, and if you see that you have not been living at the level you ought to live, in the commitment you ought to live, with the consecration you ought to live, if you see that you have not been living consistently, living right, living righteously, and living to the glory of God, he said, remember, as you hear this word of God, and repent. Chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. He said what you heard at the beginning of your Christian life. What you heard at the beginning when you gave your life to the Lord. When you surrender your life to the Lord. And when you made those commitments and consecration to the Lord, he said, you must remember how you received and how you heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And so you understand why we're looking at Jude chapter 1 verse 11 tonight. Because the Lord has told us over and over in many passages of scripture. Remember, I'm talking to you tonight, teaching from the word of God. From that verse 11 of Jude chapter 1. I'm talking about a timely remember, remembrance, a timely reminder for a time Heaven watch pilgrims. A timely reminder. Timely remember. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that is necessary today. Necessary for you. And thank God you are here. Say thank God I'm here. And because you are here, now there's a timely reminder for you. Because you are an end time heaven watch pilgrim. There are three things we're going to consider. You can see in that verse, it breaks into three naturally. Number one, about Cain. Number two, about Balaam. Number three, about Korah. Number one. Number one, the perception of worship by religious Cain. See, Cain was religious. That's why he brought an offering to the Lord. The perception of worship. 
how did Cain look at worship? How did Cain understand worship? What was the perception of Cain about worship? And what's your own understanding? What's your perception about worship? That's what the Lord is telling us here. He's saying, you need to take note and you need to understand how God perceives, how God understands, how God evaluates, how God puts a mark on your sacrifice, on your gift, on your offering. How does he perceive your worship? The perception of worship by religious king. Point number two now is the perversion of his will by reprobate compromisers. That's talking about Balaam and people like Balaam. Balaam was a backslider, a backsliding prophet. Balaam was a compromiser. He knew the will of God. He perverted that will of God. He turned that will of God upside down. He saw the will of God. This is the way. He went another way. God said, you must not. You will not. And then he went back to God again. He said, God, have you changed your mind? Can I do what I like to do now? Can I abandon your first will? Can I set aside what you told me at first? And can I go this way now? The perversion of his will by that reprobate compromiser. Number two then is the perversion of his will by reprobate compromisers. Number three. Number three is about Korah and his company. Korah and the people he influenced. Korah and the people he gathered around himself so that they will resist the word of God. They will abandon the way of God. And they will resist what the Lord had revealed. That tells us then number three, the perdition of the willful through rebellious conspiracy. Korah gathered some people around him and they conspired against what they knew they ought to do. The perversion of the willful through rebellious conspiracy. We're coming to number one. Do you remember number one? Tell me number one over there. The perversion of worship by religious Cain. Come back to Jude. Come back to Jude. In Jude verse 11. Look at the first three words there. Warn to them. What does he mean warn to them? Korah, Balaam, Cain, the three of them. Warn to them. Punishment, perdition, suffering, sorrow, calamity. Because they went away from the revelation of the Lord. And the Lord wants you to remember that. Woe unto them. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 3. We're looking at verse 9. Isaiah chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 9. The revelation of the word of God. The word of God brings light. And when you hear the word. And you stand on the word. And you believe the word. And then the word makes a change in your life. That it turns you around. It transforms your life. You are not like Cain. You will not be like Cain. Somebody there said you will not be like Cain. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 3 verse 9. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Look at verse 11 there. Woe unto them. Woe unto the wicked. That's talking about every wicked man. Every wicked woman. In every generation. That's talking about you if you're wicked. Because that was what happened to Cain. Wicked man. 
wicked woman. It says in verse 11, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. The perversion of worship by religious Cain. Let's look at this story. In Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 3. Genesis chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that came brought of the fruits of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But here is it. But, you know, God had been saying something good. He had respect for the sacrifice of Abel. He had acceptance for the sacrifice of Abel. He had approval for the sacrifice of Abel. But now it says in verse 4, in verse 5, But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. Something about Cain. Number one, his worship was unacceptable. Unacceptable to God. His worship was unacceptable to God. That's why it says God did not have respect, approval, acceptance unto his offering. But many people think it doesn't matter the condition of my heart. It doesn't matter the condition of my life. I might be a sinner. I might be a sinner on Saturday night. And then go to church on Sunday. Whatever I've done, I offer something to God. God accepts. No, sir. No, madam. God is a holy God. All I've seen and come short of the glory of God. The false sacrifice you bring is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because without the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, we're all dead in the sight of God. Unacceptable in the sight of God. Our money means nothing. Our yam means nothing. Our potatoes means no, mean nothing. The fruit we bring, fruit of the ground, it means nothing. If your heart is filled with sin, and that is what happened to Cain. But you see, in the case of Abel, he came to the Lord and he offered his sacrifice with blood. An animal that will take his place. He says, that's my substitute. He says, that's my sin bearer. He says, that's my sacrifice. As we come today, we come looking at Calvary. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And when you look at Jesus Christ, number one, as your substitute, you should have died. Jesus died for you. And then you look at Jesus Christ as your sin bearer. He took your sins and carried them away. Then you look at Christ as a sacrifice, atonement for your sin. You look at Christ as your savior, my substitute, my sin bearer, my sacrifice, my savior. It's when you look at Christ like that, he takes your sins away. And then, whatever you bring to God after that is acceptable. But if you have not held to Jesus Christ, you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you come like Cain. And then you offer something unto the Lord. Number one, Cain's sacrifice and such sacrifice unacceptable unto the Lord. Number two, it was wrath. He was angry. Look at that. In Genesis chapter 4, reading from verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. He was angry. Here is anger without a cause. He was angry at Abel. Hey, tell me. What has Abel done against Cain? Nothing. 
He made his own sacrifice. And Cain could have gone to make a similar sacrifice. But because he was rejected. And Abel was accepted. That's the reason why he became angry. Look at what Jesus said about such anger. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. Matthew chapter 5 verse 22. It says, but I say unto you. This Jesus but I say unto you, this is the one that is going to judge us on the final day. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, without a reason. Cain, what reason have you got to be angry against Abel? There's no reason. There's no cause. Is an anger is hatred it's wrath without any reason and jesus said that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment and he went on to say that whosoever shall say raker that means an empty-headed fellow is not just angry and quiet to be angry and quiet is even bad enough. And then now to say, Rekha, empty-headed fellow, it shall be in danger of the counsel. And whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of, tell me there, hellfire, shall be in danger of hellfire. In the case of Cain, he was angry. Ah, don't talk about Cain alone. Somebody there. Angry against your brother. No receipt, just angry. Angry against your wife. That's why they divorce. Angry against your husband. You cannot divorce except you get angry first. You cannot slap that woman. You cannot abuse that your husband. You cannot be rude except you get angry. And if you get angry and you manifest anger, that's why there's violence in the home. That's how the leaders are angry against their subordinates. And that's how the office workers are angry against each other. And they do things. When you, when you get angry, you do what you shouldn't do. And Jesus said, like Cain, you'll be in danger of judgment. Let's come back to Genesis chapter 4. I'm reading now from verses 6 and 7. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wrath? Why are you angry? Why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, think about that. God said, Cain, if you did well, I'll accept you. I've not accepted you because you did not do well. Cain didn't do well. I give money to the beggars. Uh -uh, that doesn't mean you're doing well. You're not born again. And I give sacrifice, gifts in the church. You have not done well. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then house, if you abandon that false commandment of the Lord, believe you turn away from your sin. And you repent of all your sins, you confess and forsake, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. He died for me. If you don't do that, you are bringing goats, you are bringing chicken, you are bringing this and that. And God says, you've not done well. And there are people like that. They praise themselves as if they were religious people. Like Cain was very religious and yet has not done well. Look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading here from verse 15. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. I've sacrificed. I gave this to somebody. I gave that to somebody. I gave that to a church. It says, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Cain 
did not do well. I pray you will do well. Somebody there said you will do well. And, and you know sometimes it's not just ordinary people. And it's not just sinners. Sometimes God tells a minister. A preacher. A pastor. A bishop. And he says, like he told Cain, you have not done well. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 2. Revelation chapter 3 verse 2. Here Jesus said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Think about your service. Think about your ministry. Think about what you offer to the Lord as a minister, as a leader, as a preacher, as a bishop. And God says, Christ is saying here, you've not done well enough. I have not found your work perfect before God. Cain should have done something about that. But he would not because he only managed to be religious but not righteous. Number one, his worship was unacceptable to God. Number two, he was full of wrath and anger. And that brings him under judgment. Number three, he didn't do well. Number four, he was evil and wicked. Evil and wicked. I'm looking at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 12. Not as Cain, that's the same Cain here, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. He was of the wicked one and then his works were evil. And the way to turn and the way to have a change and the way to have a transformation is to come and don't cover up anything. You come before the Lord and say, Lord, I know this is evil. I've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been justifying myself thinking I'm all right. I'm good. I'm sacrificing. I go to church. I was baptized as an infant. I take the Holy Communion. And my life is as wicked, as evil as any other person. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. You come to the Lord and you repent. And the Lord will forgive you in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for Bakaliki. Amen. In uh, Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Uh, look, this is very important. Very important. Open your Bible. Proverbs chapter 21. Uh, I'm looking at verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. Look at that. The sacrifice of the wicked. The wicked. The thief. The violent man. The adulterer, the fornicator, the gambler, he brings sacrifice to God. He will not repent. He will not hold on to Jesus Christ to be his personal savior. Only religion. And the Lord is saying the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind that's came. He brought the sacrifice with a wicked mind. Let, let's come back to Genesis chapter 4. I see something that happened. What God said to that man. What God said about that man. Genesis chapter 4 verse 11. It says in verse 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth. Which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. From thine hand, he was cursed and damned. He was cursed and damned. That's Genesis, the beginning of the Old Testament. And let's come to the end of the Old Testament. Malachi, I'm looking at chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. 
And I'm reading here from verse 14. What happened to Cain happens to every other person that does like Cain, that acts like Cain, that brings a sacrifice, a worthless sacrifice, a useless sacrifice, an abominable sacrifice, an unacceptable sacrifice in the sight of the Lord. In Malachi chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. Malachi chapter 1, verse 14, but cursed be the deceiver which has in his flock a male and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. It tells us then that. If we are bringing anything to the Lord, the very first sacrifice is the sacrifice of Jesus. He died for you to take your sins away and to wash your sins away. We we'll sing it in our songs. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can take all the stains away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the precious flow. And when it flows into your heart, it cleanses you from all sin. That's the false sacrifice. And now the Bible says that man was of the wicked one, of the wicked one. Come back to first for John again. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And in verse 12, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. He was of the wicked one, the offspring of the wicked one, the follower of the wicked one, the property of the wicked one. Cain was of the wicked one. Turn back to verse 8. Look at verse 8 of that same chapter. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. The same thing. The sinner today, the sinner at that time. The wicked man today, the wicked man at that time, all the same of the wicked one. And what can turn all that sin away? What can erase that wickedness away from your life? You do what Cain failed to do. That man was of the wicked one, and he never turned to the Lord, but he turned to the Lord. Lord, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Rock of ages, clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side with flood be of sin the double kill. Cleanse me, wash me, forgive me, save me, change my life. Tonight, the Lord will do it in Jesus' name. In life, it was of the wicked one. Until death, it was of the wicked one. At death, he was of the wicked one. After death, he was of the wicked one. Think about that. A man in life, all through his life, from the time God spoke to him, no change, no change, no change. He was of the wicked one. Until he died, he remained of the wicked one. At the point of death, he remained of the wicked one. After death, he remained of the wicked one. What happened to him eventually? Where you see now, I want you to come to Matthew chapter 23 Matthew chapter 23 I'm reading from verse 33 Matthew chapter 23 verse 33 ye serpents and ye generation of vipers how can you escape the damnation of hell wherefore behold I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. And some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Listen to this. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Who shed the blood of Abel? I said who shed the blood of Abel? Cain. And the Lord said here... People like Cain, with Cain himself, they will not escape the damnation of hell. In uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Matthew chapter 45, chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say 
also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels because he was of the wicked one he'll spend eternity with the devil in hellfire i will not go to hellfire i will not go to hellfire i will not be like him come back to jude chapter 1 verse 11 jude chapter 1 and i'm reading to you here from verse 11 it says in uh, chapter 1 of jude verse 11 warn to them for they have gone the way of cain we come to number two now and ran greedily after the error of balaam for reward ran greedily after the error of balaam for reward the perversion of god's will by reprobate compromisers woe unto them look at ezekiel chapter 13 ezekiel chapter 13 we're reading here from verse 3 ezekiel chapter 13 and i'm reading from verse 3 it says thus says the lord woe to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and i've seen nothing balaam was regarded a prophet he became a false prophet a foolish prophet a fallen prophet a compromising prophet a corrupted prophet a corrupting prophet and the word of god says woe unto them woe to the foolish prophet to the fallen prophets Woe to this false prophet that has followed his own spirit and have seen nothing. The story of Balaam, very instructive, and tells us to be very careful. To start with, Balaam knew the will of God. Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. I'm reading here from verse 7. Numbers chapter 22. And we're looking at verse 7. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hands. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lord, here this night. And I will bring you words again as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balaam, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, cause me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not cause the people, for they are blessed. He knew the will of God. That's the will of God. It, God told him what he must not do. You won't tell me you don't know the will of God. The will of God is that you repent. Don't tell me you don't know the will of God. The will of God is your repentance. The will of God is your holiness. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification is a holy God. And he commands us to be holy. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. Don't tell me you don't know the will of God. The will of God is that you'll take Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus as your sanctifier. 
Jesus as the purifier of your soul that will turn your soul, your life around and take you to heaven on the basis of following peace with God and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Balaam knew the will of God and so he told the people, I cannot go with you. God has said, I must not go. Those people went back to Balak, the king of Moab. And he said, the man will not come. Oh, he must come. Why wouldn't he come? Maybe the money is not enough. Maybe what I sent, what I promised, is not enough. Look at chapter 22, verse 15. And Balak sent yet again princess more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said unto him, Thus says Balaam, the son of Zippor, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, cause me this people. And so when they made a greater offer, greater promise, and greater money, look at what he said in verse 18. And Balaam answered and said unto the servant of Balak, if Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the words of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, I pray you, look at this, tarry ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. Uh -uh. God says, I am God, I change not. I am God, I change not. Can you say that with me? One, two, three, go. I am God, I change not. Say that aloud, let me hear you. What he said was evil before, is still evil today. Polygamy was evil, is still evil today. Divorce is evil, is still evil today. Corruption is evil, is still evil today. Whatever God condemned before, he still condemns now. I am God, I change not. But the man had an idol in the heart. And when you have an idol in the heart, and you go to God and say, God, think about this for me. God, tell me an answer here. God, tell me something here. You know the will of God. You know the mind of God. And you're going to tempt God. Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 14, we're looking at verse 1. In verse 1 it says, in Ezekiel 14, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. They love something more than my word. These men have set up their idols in their hearts. They love their money more than they love me. These men have set their idols in their heart. What they wish to do, what they desire to do, and what they want to enjoy, what they want to run after, what they want to get, what they want to, the deal they want to make. They love that more than the will of God. These men have said they are idols in their heart and they have put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Look at that man. He says he's a believer. And the word of God is very clear. Be not unequally yoked together with some believers. A believer, a born again child of God, cannot marry, must not marry, will not marry. An unbeliever is, is a, a child of Satan. He knows that. He knows the word of God. But there's an idol in his heart. I will pray about it. I will take it to the Lord in prayer. I will hear what the Lord will say. Hey, you'll be deceived. Because this man, this woman has set the idol in the heart. Look at verse 4. Therefore, speak unto them and say unto them, 
Thus says the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idol in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Therefore, in verse 6, say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. And so we learn about uh, Balaam. Number one, he knew the will of God. Number two, he had an idol in the heart. Something about Balaam. He spoke well, but he acted to the contrary. Balaam, what a pity. Balaam, a compromiser. He knew the doctrine. He knew the mind of God. He spoke well. But he didn't follow what he said. Look at what he said. Let's come back now to Numbers. Yeah, that's why the Bible says, Woe unto them. They have run greedily after the error of Balaam. We're looking at Numbers chapter 22. And see what he said. The people who know how to speak well. How to preach well. How to counsel well. How to advise well. But they don't have the grace. The strength. To do. What they're supposed to do. The way they counsel. Look at what he said. In Numbers chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 18. And Balaam answered. And said unto the servant of Balak. A Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Good talk. Good talk. Knew how to talk. I knew what to say. But he acted to the contrary. Look at verse 38. Chapter 22 and verse 38. In verse 38 it says, Balaam said, it's always saying, Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. Good talk, bad lie, bad behavior. Bad action. There are people like that. They sing. They talk. They even preach to other people. They invite people to church. But the church is not in them. The life of the Christian is not visible in their lives. Even though they know how to talk. Chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 12. Talk. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord has put in my mouth? That's still Balaam. Look at the chapter 24, verse 13. Chapter 24. And in verse 13, here is Balak. And, and if, Balak, if Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind. But what the Lord says that I will speak. That's the talk. But let me show you the end of the man. We're looking at chapter 31. Chapter 31. And we're looking at verse 8. Chapter 31 verse 8. Have you opened your Bible? I said, have you opened your Bible? At Bacali, can say yes. yes. Look at chapter 31, verse 8. And he slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest that was slain, namely Evi, Rechem, Zor, Hor, Reba, five kings of Midian. Tell me what's next there. Balaam also, the son of Bill, the slew with the sword. He had joined the Moabites to fight against the Israelites. He spoke well. He acted to the contrary. What was his problem? 
What was the idol? What was the sin that made him to fall? And what makes many people to fall today? Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Second Peter chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 15 to verse 16. Which have, which have forsaken the right way. Balaam knew the right way. He could have been saved. He could have remained saved. But he forsook the right way. And had gone astray following the way of Balaam. The son of Bozal. Who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. Another name for that is love of money. First Timothy chapter 6. In First Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. But they that will be rich, like Balaam, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money does the root of stealing. The love of money does the root of corruption. The love of money, that's the root of dubious business. The love of money is the root of fraud. The love of money is the root of gambling. The love of money is the root of killing other people to have their property. The love of money is the root of all evil, which was some coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through. With many sorrows. You know the end of Balaam? You know what he did at last? When he couldn't get the money. Because he couldn't curse the children of Israel. He wanted to open his mouth and curse them. But he couldn't. And so he said, and I still need this money. And I want this money. And so he counseled Balak. He said, if you will throw your ladies, your women, your beautiful Moabite women to them, and they begin to commit evil with them, fornication and adultery with them, God will forsake them in that way. You'll be able to catch them. He said, how did you know that? Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading here to you from verse 14. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. Here is what Jesus said, telling us and reminding us of the story of the life of Balaam, what he did eventually. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou wast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. That's what he taught Balak. To do for the children of Israel. Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. We're looking at that from verse 16. You'll see where it's recorded. What he did. And how he eventually joined them in battle. And then he was killed. He was killed. He died as a compromiser. He died as a reprobate man. Never repented. Could not repent. And he could not spend the money he got dubiously. It tells us in Numbers chapter 31 verse 16. The, behold, these cost 
the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of pure. And there was a plague among the congregation of Israel. He taught corruption. Nobody like him has done that before him. That will call somebody and say, this is how to corrupt a nation. So that you can destroy that nation. And there might be people that that today who are teaching other people how to sin. Teaching other people how to be corrupt. Teaching other people how to do evil. And the same judgment that came upon Balaam will come upon them because God says, I am the Lord, I change not. Look at chapter 25, Numbers chapter 25. We're reading from verse 1. Numbers chapter 25, reading from verse 1. It tells us in verse 1 of Numbers chapter 25, And Israel abode in Shittim. And the people began to commit wardom. That's adultery, fornication, immorality, licentiousness. They began to commit sin with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Actually, that brought the death of thousands and thousands and thousands of the children of Israel. Because they went into evil. Look at verse 9. Those and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. 24,000 died because of the counsel of corruption that Balaam gave unto Balak, the king of Moab. That's why it says, one to them. They have gone in the way of Cain. One to them. They have run greedily after the error of Balaam. I pray the Lord will have mercy upon you in Jesus' name. I pray the Lord will help you that you will stand your ground and you'll say, by the grace of God, I will not live like Cain. Somebody there tell me, I will not live like Cain. Stop that stuff. I will not live like Cain. And I will not live like Korah. And I will not be like Balaam. I'm coming back to Jude, and we're looking at chapter 1, verse 11. Chapter 1, we're looking at verse 11. It says, woe unto them. It's talking about the sinners. Woe unto them. It's talking about those religious worshippers. It says, woe unto them. It's talking about those reprobate compromisers. It says, woe unto them. It's talking about the rebellious conspirators. Look at this in verse 11. One to them. For they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain sin of Corinth. Point number three now. The perdition of the willful through rebellious conspiracy. The perdition of the willful through rebellious conspiracy. The story is in Numbers chapter 16. Turn your Bible to Numbers chapter 16. And you will see what happened. And you will see what the Lord is saying. We should be careful of. We should be free from. And we should not allow in our lives. We're looking at number one, Korah and his company. Korah and his company. Chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, Now Korah, 
the son of Isa, the son of Kohas, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on, and the son of Peles, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses, with certain men of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, popular men, famous men. And he gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto him, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. And there wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. See what these people said, Korah and his company. Korah and his rebellious conspirators. They said, you take too much upon you. You lift yourself. You appoint yourself as a leader over them. Korah, that's a lie. Moses did not appoint himself. Aaron did not appoint himself. The Almighty God appointed them. And he sent them. And he said it shall bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Get them through the wilderness. And get them to the land of promise. The land of Canaan. The land flowing with milk and honey. And look at the lie they told. And now they had contention. What was the basis of their contention? The reason for their contention place seeking promotion sell promotion they wanted to be in the prison look at verse 8 and Moses said unto Korah here I pray you sons of Levi Simothy it is small sin unto you that the Lord God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. Listen to this. And he brought thee to hear near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee and seek ye the priesthood also. Seek ye the priesthood also. They were famous already. They wanted more attention. They wanted popularity. They wanted a place. They wanted a place where God had not appointed them. And now they manifested open rebellion. Open rebellion. You know, there are people that conspire together against the leadership of their company, against the leadership of their community, against the leadership of whatever against the leadership of a local church they do that privately in the case of Korah, Dathan and Abiram and their company they did it publicly open rebellion look at verse 12 and Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab which said we will not come up is it a small scene that thou hast brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us moreover thou hast not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey or giving us inheritance of the fields and the vineyards will thou put out the eyes of these men we will not come up that's rebellion open rebellion and not only that they had bad influence on the congregation evil influence on the congregation they led innocent people astray you know in any large congregation there are people that do not know they are led from their right and Korah and his conspirators they led all those innocent people away from the path of righteousness look at verse 18 in verse 18 and they took every man his censer and put fire in them and they laid incense thereon and they took in the and they stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron and Korah gathered all the congregation against them Korah gathered all the congregation against Moses and Aaron and said, no, we're not going to have the leadership of Moses. We're not going to have the leadership of Aaron. 
all you congregation what do you say they say yes rebellious people sinful people backsliding people the people innocent people that turned out of the right way verse 19 Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation the glory of the lord appeared unto all the congregation and then eventually judgment was pronounced you see there's judgment upon the people that live in sin there is judgment upon the people that backslide. There is judgment upon the people that compromise and they go the wrong direction. Remember once again, he says, I'm the Lord, I change not. And if you go that wrong direction today, judgment will come upon you. If you are in conspiracy, if you are an evil, if you are a compromiser, if you turn from the right way, and then you follow the people to do evil. There is judgment. Let me show you Ecclesiastes. I'm looking at chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're looking at verse 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What we've been studying today about Cain, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. About Balaam, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. About Korah, Dathan and Abiram, about Korah and his company, about Korah and his conspirators, the people that cooperated with him to have conspiracy. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. About the congregation that was led astray, those people that will not think that is evil. I will not follow anybody to do evil. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. God shall bring every action of Cain into judgment. God shall bring every compromise of Balaam into judgment. God shall bring every conspiracy of Korah into judgment. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret sin, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And you see, after Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and the 250 princes that were famous after judgment came upon them. The evil of those conspirators lingered on. Because they said, ah, you've killed the servants of the Lord. And the plague rose up in the land amidst the people of Israel. And many of them died. The Lord is teaching us today. And he's saying, you've seen their evil way. You've seen what others have done. And you've seen the error of the lives of the people that will not turn away from sin. That will not come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And take the blood of the Lamb to cleanse their soul. And to give them forgiveness. And to turn them the right with the right direction. And he says now, don't follow them. Thank God I see people there tonight. You will not follow Cain. Amen. You will not follow Balaam. And you will not follow Korah. If you have done any evil, you come to the Lord. You'll not be proud like Cain. You'll not be proud like Balaam. You'll not be proud like Korah. You'll not just tell your sin. You'll say, Lord, I come because Jesus has come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he takes, take my yoke upon you and learn of me because I am lowly. And he says, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my body is light. Somebody there today is turning to the Lord. I said somebody there today is turning to the Lord. 
and is confessing the sin and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I will not go back to those evil things anymore. The way of Cain, I cancel that. The way of Balaam, I cancel that. The life of Korah, I cancel that. I will be righteous. I will be holy. I will follow the way of the Lord. And I will follow Jesus Christ from today until I get to heaven on that final day. What am I talking about there? Raise up your hand. Where are you? Stand up now and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. I've learned something today. Believe us, remember. Believe us, remember. Believe us, remember. The end of the people that go away from the Lord. Remember. And then turn to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, here am I. I will serve you to the end. Open your mouth and pray. Let me hear at Bakalik here and uh, the Bonji State people praying and praying with all your heart and telling the Lord, Oh Lord, today I turn to you. I will live the way you want me to live. I'll be a righteous child of God. The way of Cain is cancelled in my life and the way of Balaam is cancelled out of my life and the way of Korah is cancelled out of my life. Speak to the Lord and the Lord will have mercy on you. I call on a state of a here, Pastor Amma to lead us in prayer.